Continuing with book three, chapter 24, verse 59. There was a dead silence in one spot, caused by perfect calmness of the breeze, while another spot presented a scene of a hundred peaks rising on a mountain-like cloud. In one place, raining clouds roared loudly in their fury, and in another a furious battle was waging in the clouds between the gods and demons. In some place, geese were seen gabbling in the lotus lake of the sky, inviting the ganders by their loud crackling cries. Forms of fishes, crocodiles, and alligators were seen flying in the air as if they had been transformed into aerial beings by the holy waters of the Ganges of their birth. Somewhere, as the sun went down the horizon, they saw the dark shadow of the earth eclipse the moon. Then they saw the shadow of the moon eclipse the sun. They saw a magical, flower garden, exhaling its fragrance in the air and strewing the floor of heaven with a profusion of flowers scattered by a shower of morning dew. They saw all beings contained in the three worlds flying in the air like a swarm of gnats in the hollow of a fig tree. Then the two excellent ladies stopped their astral journey, intent upon revisiting the earth. Chapter 25, Description of Astral Travel Over Earth, Vashishta Speaking. Then these ladies, in their forms of intelligence, alighted from the sky and passing over the mountainous regions, saw the houses of men on the surface of the earth. They saw the world appearing like a lotus in the heart of Nara, the primal, primeval man or eternal spirit pervading the universe. In eight sides from the flower petals, the hills, its pistol, and the center contains its sweet flavor. The rivers are tubes of its filaments, covered with drops of snow resembling their pollen. Days and nights rolled over it like swarms of black bees and butterflies. And all its living beings appear like gnats fluttering about. Its long stalks, white as bright daylight, are composed of fibers serving for food and of tubes conducting the drink to living beings. It is wet with moisture, sucked by the sun, resembling a swan swimming about in the air. In the darkness of night and absence of the sun, it finds itself in sleep. The earth, like a lotus, is situated on the surface of the waters of the ocean. At times, the motion of the earth, of the ocean makes the earth shake, causing earthquakes. 
the earth rests upon the serpent Seisha as its support and is girt about by demons as its thorns and prickles. Mount Meru and other mountains are its large seas. There are great hives of human population where the fair daughters of the giant race embraced with the sons of gods and created the race of men. It has the extensive continent of Jambudvipa, Asia, situated in one petal, its veins forming its divisions and the tubular filaments, its rivers. The seven elevated mountains forming the boundary lines of its continent are its seeds. And in the middle, the great Mount Sumeru reaches the sky. Its lakes are like dewdrops on a lotus leaf, and its forests are like the flowers are. The people inhabiting the land all around are like a swarm of bees. Its extent is a thousand leaves, yonis, square, and it is surrounded on all sides by the dark sea like a belt of black bees. It contains nine divisions, marshes, ruled by nine brother kings, resembling the regions of its eight petal sides with Bharata Varsha, India in the middle. It stretches a thousand miles with more land than water. Its inhabitable parts are as thick as frozen ice in winter. The continent is surrounded by the briny ocean twice as large, like a bracelet encircles the wrist. Beyond it lies the circular form of Saka Hunting, twice the size of Jambu Duipa, and also encircled by a sea. This is called the Milky Ocean because of the sweetness of its water. And it is double the size of the former salt sea. Beyond that, and double its size, is Kushadwipa continent, full of population. It is also circular and surrounded by another sea, the belt of the Sea of Kurds delectable to the gods and double the size of the continent it encircles. After that, the circle of Karoncha continent, also twice the size of the former one and surrounded by a sea like a canal surrounds a city. This sea is called the Sea of Butter and is twice as large as the continent it surrounds. Beyond it lies Salmali continent, surrounded by the foul sea of wine. The fair belt of this sea resembles a sheath of white flowers like the girdle of the Seisha serpent, forming the necklace 
hanging on the breast of Vishnu. Thereafter, stretches Plaksa Kanta, double the size of the former and surrounded by the belt of the sea of sugar that appears like the snowy plains of Himalaya. After that lies the belt of Pushkara Kanta, twice as large as the preceding one and encircled by a sea of sweet water, double its circumference. There at the distance of 10 degrees, they saw the belt of the South Polar Circle with its hideous cave below, the descent to the infernal region. The way to the infernal cave is full of danger and fear and ten times in length from the circle of Kantam. This cave is surrounded on all sides by a dreadful emptiness and below it is half covered by a thick gloom as if a blue lotus were attached to it. There stood Loka Loka Sumeru, or the South Pole Mountain, which is bright with sunshine on one side and covered by darkness on the other, studded with various gems. on its petals and decked with flowers growing upon it. It reflected the glory of the three worlds situated on its peak like a cap of hairs. At a great distance from it is a great forest that is not trodden by the feet of any living being. Then, proceeding upward, they saw the great northern ocean, encompassing the pole on all sides. Further on, they saw the flaming light of the aurora borealis, which threatened to melt the snowy mountains to water. Proceeding onward, they met with the fierce north winds, blowing with all their fury and force. They threatened to uproot the mountains as if they were dust or cracks. They traversed the empty vacuum with their noiseless motion. Far away, they saw the empty space of vacuum stretching wide all about them. It spreads unlimited and encompasses the world like a golden bracelet encircles the wrist. Thus, Leela, having seen the seas and mountains, the rulers of the world, the city of the gods, the sky above and the earth below, in the unlimited vault of the universe, suddenly returned to her own land and found herself in her room again. Chapter 26. Return of the Holy Brahmin's House. Description of Gloom. Vashista explains astral appearance. Vashista said, After the excellent ladies had returned from their visit of physical sphere, they entered the house where the holy Brahman used to live. 
There the holy ladies, unseen by anyone, saw the tomb of the Brahmin. The maid servants were dejected with sorrow, and the faces of women were soiled with tears, faded like lotuses with their withered leaves. All joy had fled from the house, leaving it like the dry bed of the Dead Sea after its waters were sucked. It was like a garden parched in summer or a tree struck by lightning. It was as joyless as a dried lotus torn by a blast or withering under frost. As faint as the light of a lamp without a wick or oil, and as dim as the eyeball without its light. The house without its master was as sad as the face of a dying person, or like a forest with its falling and withered leaves or like dry and dusty ground for lack of rain. Then Leela, with her grand gracefulness of divine knowledge, the elegance of her perfection, and her devotion for truth, thought within herself that the residents of the house might see her. And the goddess, in her ordinary forms as human beings. Then the people of the house saw the two ladies, as Lakshmi and Gauri, brightening the house with the light of their being. Wreaths of unfading flowers of various kinds adorned the two women from head to foot. They seemed like the personifications of spring season, perfuming the house with the fragrance of a flower garden. They appeared to rise like a pair of moons with their cooling and pleasant beams, infusing a freshness to the family like moonlight does to medicinal plants in forests and villages. The soft glances of their eyes under the dark, under the long, loose, and pendant curls of hair were like a shower of white malati flowers from the dark, cloudy spots of their black lined eye. Their bodies were as bright as melted gold and as vibrant as a flowing stream. Their brilliance cast a golden color on the spot where they stood as they did over the forest all around. The natural beauty of Lakshmi's body and the trembling glare of Leela's body spread as it were a sea of radiance about them in which their bodies seemed to move like undulating waves. their relaxed arms resembling loose vines, their palms like red leaflets shook like the fresh scalp of vines in the forest. They touched the ground with their feet that resembled the fresh and tender petals of a flower or like lotuses growing upon the ground. Their appearance seemed to sprinkle ambrosial dews all around, 
and made the dry, withered, and brown branches of tomorrow trees sprout new, tender leaflets. On seeing them, the whole family with Jeshta Sharma, the eldest son of the deceased Brahman, cried aloud and said, Hail to the woodland goddesses. And threw handfuls of flowers on their feet. The flower offerings that fell on their feet resembled showers of dewdrop falling on lotus leaves in a lake of lotus leaves. Jaisa Sharma said, Hail you goddesses who have come here to dispel our sorrow. It is inborn in the nature of good people to deliver others from their distress. The goddesses address them gently. Tell us the cause of your sorrow, which has made you all so sad. Then, one by one, Jaisa Sarma and others described their sorrows owing to the death of the Brahmin couple. They said, No, O goddess pair, there lived here a Brahmin and his wife who had been the support of guests and a model for Brahmin. They were our parents who recently died. They have abandoned us, leaving all their friends and domestic animals here. They have departed to heaven and left us quite helpless in this world. The birds sitting on top of the house have been continually pouring their pious and mournful sounds over the bodies of the deceased. Mountain on all sides have been lamenting their loss with the hoarse noise of winds howling in their cabin, shedding showers of tears in the courses of the streams issuing from their sides. Clouds had poured their tears in flood of rainwater, then fled from the sky. The heavenly quarters have been sending their sighs in sultry winds all around. The poor village people are wailing in piteous note, their bodies disheveled from rolling upon the ground. They are trying to yield up their lives with continued fasting. The trees are shedding their tears every day in drops of melting snow, exuding from the cells of their leaves and flowers, resembling the sockets of their eyes. They have become as empty as the hearts of men forsaken by their joys of life. Among the sad notes of cuckoos and the humming of bees, fading plants are wailing and withering from the sultry sigh of their inner life. Snows are melting from the heat of their grief. Their waters failing in cataracts that break into a hundred channels as they fall upon stony basins. 
our prosperity has fled from us. And we sit here in dumb despair of hope. Our houses have become dark and gloomy as a desert. Here the humble bees are humming in grief upon the scattered flowers in our garden that now sends forth a putrid smell instead of their former fragrance. The vines that twine so gaily around the spring trees are dwindling and dying away with their closing and fading flower. The rivulets with their loose and low rippling murmur and the light wave-like motion of their liquid bodies on the ground are running hurriedly in their sorrow to cast themselves into the sea. Despite the disturbance of the gnats flying constantly upon them, Hans are as still in their sorrow as men sitting in meditation. Truly this day, the presence of our parents is adorning that part of the heaven where heavenly singers, the Kinaras and Gandharvas and Vijidars, welcome them with their music. Therefore, O Davies, Reduce our excessive grief because the visit of the great never goes for nothing. Hearing these words, Leela gently cuts the head of her son with her hand as the lotus bed leans to touch its offshoot by the stalk. At the touch, the boy was relieved of all his sorrow and misfortune. Just like the summer heat of the mountain is reduced by the showers of a rainy season. All others in the house were as highly gratified at the sight of the goddesses as when a pauper is relieved of his poverty or the sick are healed by a draught of nectar. Rama said, remove my doubts, said. Why did Leela appear in her own form of Arundhati before her eldest son, Jeshta Sarma? Jeshta answered, you forget, O Rama, and think that Leela had a material body or could assume one at pleasure. She was in an astral form, her form of pure intellect. And it was with her spiritual hand that she touched the inner spirit of the boy and not his material body. Belief in materialism leads one to think this unreal earthy frame is real. Just like a boy's belief in ghosts makes him take a shadow for a spirit. But this belief in one's materiality is soon over upon conviction of one's spirituality. Just like the traces of our vision in a dream are removed on the knowledge of their unreality upon waking. Belief that 
matter is an empty nothing leads to the knowledge of spirit a glass door appears as an open space to someone of an irritable temperament in the same way matter appears as nothing to the mind a dream presents the sights of cities lands air and water where there is no such things <clears throat> in actuality. A dream causes the movement of our limbs and bodies for no purpose. As air appears as earth in dreaming, so the non-existent world appears to exist in waking. It is thus that men see and talk of things unseen and unknown in their fits of delirium. Children see ghosts in the air and a dying man sees a forest. Others see elephants in the clouds and some see pearls in sunbeam. Those who are panic struck and deranged in their minds, the half waking and the passengers in vessels see many appearances like such ghosts and forests and betray what they see in dreams by the movements of their bodies. In this manner, everyone is of the form of whatever he thinks himself to be. It is only habit that makes him to believe himself as such. He is not so in reality. But Leela, who had known the truth of the non-existence of the world, was conscious of its nothingness and viewed all things as false conceptions of the mind. Thus, he who sees only Brahma filling the sphere of his consciousness has no room for a son or a friend or a wife. He who views the whole as filled with the spirit of Brahma, with nothing produced in it, has no room or affection or hatred for anybody in it. The hand that Leela laid on the head of Jaista Sarma, her eldest son, was not lame from her maternal affection for him, but for his edification in intellectual knowledge. Consciousness being awakened, there is all joy attendant upon it. It is more subtle than ether and far purer than vacuum and leads the intellectual being above the region of air. All other things are like images in a dream. Chapter 27. Leela remembers her past life. Vasista speaking. Then the two ladies disappeared from that place, leaving the Brahmin family in their house in the mountainous village. The family exclaimed, 
We are highly favored by the woodland goddesses. Then, forgetting their grief, they return to their domestic employment. Then, the ethereal goddess spoke to the ethereal Lila, who stood fixed in the air of the Brahmin's house in a state of mutual mute astonishment. They conversed with each other as familiarly as persons having the same thoughts and desires agree with each other in their views and acts. And as the dreamers of the same dream hold their mutual correspondence, like Usha and Aniruddha. Their conversation in the material forms was of the same intellectual kind as we are conscious of in our dreams and imagination. Saraswati said, now you have fully known the knowable and you have become acquainted with whatever is visible and invisible. Such is the essence of Brahma. Say now, what more do you want to know? Leela said, tell me the reason why I was seen by my son, but wasn't seen where the spirit of my departed Lord is reigning over his realm. Saraswati replied, because then you were not perfect in your practice of meditation to have your wish fulfilled, nor had you lost your sense of duality, which prevents perfection. He who has not known unity is not edified to the acts and benefits of faith in the true God, as no one sitting in the sun can enjoy the coolness of shade. You are not practiced to forget your identity as Leela, nor had you learned that it is not your will, but the will of God that is always fulfilled. Later, you become pure desire and wished that your son might see you, whereby he was able to see you. If you should remain now to your husband and do the same, you will, be, you will undoubtedly be successful in your desire. And let's say, I see within the sphere of this dome, my mind, and the holy Brahman has been my husband before. I also see that after he died, he became a ruler of the earth. In my mind, I see that spot in the earth, that city and his palace where I set as his queen. Within myself, I see my Lord reigning in that palace, and I can even see how he died afterward. I see the glory of the ruler of so many countries on earth, and I also see the perfect frankness of his conduct throughout his life. In the inner sky of my mind, I see the world as they were placed in a casket, just like all oil is contained in a mustard seed.
I see the bright orb of my husband ever wandering before me. And now I pray you to contrive some way to place me by his side. The goddess replied, tell me, Leela, to which husband should you go? You have had and will have hundreds of them in your past and future life. And now there are three of them confined in this earth. The nearest of the three is the Brahmin here who is reduced to ashes. The next is the king lying in state and covered with flowers in the inner apartment. The third is now a reigning king on this earth and has been buffeting in the waves of error in the vast ocean of the world. His intellect is darkened and disordered by the splashing waves of worldliness. His intelligence is perverted to stupidity. He is converted to a tortoise in the ocean of the world. The management of his very many disordered state of affairs has subdued him, stupefied him into a clumsy lout. And he is now fast asleep amidst the turmoil of business. Its strong chain of his thoughts has bound him to think he is a lord, mighty and accomplished, and that he is happy and can enjoy the states forever. Now say, O oh excellent lady, to what husband do you wish to be led? Like the fragrance of one forest carried by the breeze to another. Here you are in one place and they are in others in this vast universe. The states of their lives and the manners differ widely from one another. These orbs of light in the heaven, though they appear to be placed so near to us, are situated millions of leagues apart from one another, and they carry the departed souls. All these bodies are as empty as air, though they contain the great mountains Meru and Mandara in themselves. All bodies are formed by a combination of atoms constantly proceeding from the great intellect like particles of sunbeams over the universe. The great and stupendous fabric of the world is no more than a quantity of patty rice weighed in a balance. As the spangled heavens appear, like a forest of brilliant gems, so the world appears to the contemplative mind as full of the glory of God and not composed of earth or other material body. 